Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with propositional logic, looking at the answers to the first set of problems I gave you in the last video on modus tollens about the rules of implication. I didn't say this was going to be a 90 second philosophy video because it's not. This is going to be a bit of a longer video because I really want us to understand those answers and how to solve the problems and really why the answers are correct, so that you can very easily go off and do your own logic problems on your own. With that out of the way, let's get going. So, if you didn't see the problems in the last video, here they are again. Your task is to use the rules of inference, just the four that we've learned, to go from these two premises and show that the conclusion is true, to show that these are valid arguments. If you really want to dive in and you're already pretty confident in your logic skills, go ahead, pause the video, and then watch my answers to see if you're correct. But if you're a little more shaky, if you're a beginner to logic, maybe watch the first couple and see if you can understand the way that I'm doing the proofs and the way that I'm writing them out. I have a specific way that I write out proofs so that someone who looks at them later can later understand exactly what I did and how I concluded the premises that I did. So. Let's take a look. The first problem, not P implies, Q implies P, and not P. And we concluded from this, not Q. So, if you want to try the problem on your own, you should pause the video now, because there's spoilers to follow. So, from this, we should be able to see pretty clearly that premise 2, not P, is the antecedent of premise 1's implication. It's the first part of that implication. And if we remember from modus ponens, if we have the first part of an implication and we have that implication, we're allowed to conclude the second part, the consequent of that implication, which is exactly what we're going to do. In order to write this next premise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out what I want to conclude, which is Q implies P, that second part of that first premise, and then I'm going to write how I got there. I write down Premise 1 and premise 2, modus ponens, the rule that I used at the end of the premises that I used to imply this new premise that I have. Premise 3, Q implies P. Then, I need to take this new premise and somehow end up with not Q. Well, how can I do that? Well, if I look once again at premise 2 and premise 3, I will see that, wait a second, I'm denying the second part of an implication. And I remember if I'm denying the second part of an implication, I'm allowed to use another one of those rules, the rule called modus tollens. So we write not Q, what we want to conclude, and we see that if we deny the second part of an implication, we can deny the first part. We have not P in premise 2, Q implies P in premise 3. We use modus tollens then to conclude not Q, which leaves us with our conclusion of not Q. If you got that answer? Good job. All you have to do for these problems is to just write those intermediary steps that go from the premises to the conclusion. Let's take a look at the next problem. Here we have P implies Q implies R, S implies R implies T, P, and S. We're trying to conclude from this Q implies T. If you want to try the problem on your own, feel free. If not, follow me down the rabbit hole and we'll get started. So. From this, I should be able to see, wow, it's really clear that from premise 1 and premise 3, I've got the implication statement of P implies something else, and I have that P, that first part of the implication. So, just like in the last one, I'm allowed to use modus ponens to conclude that conclusion, whatever P implies, which is Q implies R. I should also be able to see that from premise 2 and premise 4, I have once again the same situation. I have S, the first part of an implication, and S implies R implies T. So I can once again conclude that second part of my implication up in premise 2. R implies T from premise 2, premise 4, modus ponens, once again. Now I look at these two implications, Q implies R and R implies T. How can I use these to get to Q implies T? Well, I remember if the second part of one of my implications is the same as the first part of my other implication, I'm allowed to do something called hypothetical syllogism and link them together. So I do, from premise 5, premise 6, hypothetical syllogism, I conclude Q implies T, which is my final conclusion, what I'm looking for. So Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt, and we have our 
proof. Remember, we're not coming up with a new conclusion. We're just showing the steps from which we can take those premises to get to the conclusion we already have. Let's take a look at the next problem. So, we have not P implies Q, not P or not P implies S, and not Q. And we want to conclude S. If you haven't tried any of the problems yet, I would advise you look back at the video and try these methods to see if you can solve this problem. If you know all four of the rules really well. If not, or you're still a little nervous, let's do this together. So, what we're going to look at, we don't have in this problem a nice, really straightforward beginning of a implication that we can use. We don't have not P that would let us use something to imply in premise 1, but we do have not Q. And we remember, if we think back, if we deny the second part of an implication, we're allowed to deny the first part. So we can conclude not not P from premises 1 and 3 modus tollens. This may look a little weird. Not not P seems a little strange. If you put two of those little squiggly negation signs in front of a letter, you get not not that letter. Now, yes, that is just the same as P, and we're going to get to a rule of replacement called double negation that will allow us to just replace P with not not P or vice versa. But in this case, not not P is actually going to be more useful to us than P would be. Let's take a look why. What can we do with this not not P? Well, it's not just not P which would allow us to conclude Q, but then we'd have all sorts of problems because then we'd have Q and not Q. It'd be a contradiction. But we do also have not P or not Q implies S. What can we do there? Well, we should remember disjunctive syllogism lets us, when we deny part of a disjunction, part of an or statement like we have in premise 2, we're allowed to conclude the other part of that or statement. Well, not not P is just the same thing as denying not P, and that would be denying the first part of that disjunctive statement. So we should be allowed to conclude from premises 2 and 4, disjunctive syllogism, not Q implies S. Ooh, we're getting close now. We have something that directly implies S. Well, do we have a not Q lying around anywhere? I think we do up in premise 3, so we can use a good old-fashioned modus ponens to take premise 3 and premise 5 and conclude S. That's our conclusion. Finally, we're going to take a look at this last problem, which was a little bit tougher. We had not P implies, Q implies R implies P or not S. Premise 2, we had Q implies S implies not P. Premise 3 was Q implies R, and premise 4 was R implies S. The conclusion we're trying to reach is not R. Wow, that looks pretty tough. But I bet we can do it. If you want to try it on your own, pause the video now. If not, let's go. So, what we're going to do, whoa, we don't have any kind of even single proposition that we could use to deny something or imply something. But if I look at premises 3 and 4, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but maybe I can connect them up with that good old-fashioned hypothetical syllogism, because R is the second part of one and the first part of the other. Let's try that and see where it takes us. So that would give me Q implies S from premises 3 and 4, hypothetical syllogism. What can I do with Q implies S? Well, I don't have Q, so I can't actually imply S. But can I use Q imply as S for anything? Well, if I look at premise 2, I should see that Q implies S is actually the beginning of an implication statement. I can use it to conclude not P. That was cool. So now I have not P lying around from premises 2 and 5 modus ponens. What can I do with not P? Well, it should be clear. I can plug that straight into premise 1 up there to conclude all of that junk on the other end of that implication. That would be Q implies R implies P or not S from premise 1, premise 6, modus ponens. Now what I'm going to do, well, what can I do with this implication? I already have the beginning of the implication, the antecedent. I have Q implies R. So I'm going to use that to conclude P or not S from premise 3, premise 7, modus ponens. Finally, P or not S, I should once again realize I have a disjunctive syllogism possibility here. Whenever you have that disjunction, you should think of a disjunctive syllogism. I don't have not not S, but I do have not P. So I can take from that 
not s from six and eight disjunctive syllogism, and finally with my not s, I can run that backwards through premise four using modus tollens to find not r from premise four, premise nine, modus tollens, letting me conclude my wonderful conclusion of not r. Whew, that was a lot of work. There are more problems out there on the internet if you want to try them, but many of them are going to require some more of the lovely rules of implication and replacement that we're going to be doing in the next set of videos. So, keep your eyes peeled, and after the next four rules of implication, we're going to be doing another set of problems if you didn't like that set or you want to try some more. Watch a new video every single day for a hundred days here at Carnades.org. Stay skeptical, everybody.